You're listening to The Dating Den with dating and relationship badass and best-selling author Marnie Batista. Every week, you'll get the raw truth from top experts and real people on the important dating, sex, and relationship issues you want to know about. So if you're ready for true talk that's authentic and unfiltered, and you're not afraid to be called out on your <clears throat> stuff, then you're ready for what's next. The Dating Den, episode 70 with Ariel Ford. Why efforting will actually set you back in your dream to find love. Ladies, welcome into the Dating Den. I have a fan favorite back here in the den with me. I have the amazing Ariel Ford, and I'm super excited because we have a lot to talk about. And one of them is really, really near and dear and special, I know, to Ariel because her sister Debbie, who passed away, um, has left a gift in the form of a book that was sort of recently discovered and just published. And so I just think it's really beautiful, meaningful, and just delicious to be able to talk to Arielle about that book and also about, you know, really the whole idea of manifesting love using the the, the notion of quantum science. So Arielle, thank you for coming back into my little den. Oh, I always like to hang out in the den with you, Marnie. We always have a good time. Right. Last time we talked, you just got back from Italy. Are you going anywhere cool anytime yeah. soon? Uh, we're going to Santorini and to Venice for our 20th anniversary in June. I love it. Well, I can't. We'll have to have you back and see if there's any other delicious metaphors that come <laughs> from. <laughs> from Greece and some more Italy. So I love that. Travel with Ariel. Maybe that's your your next uh your next book. <laughs> that could be. Lo- love and travel with Ariel Ford. Well, let's talk about Debbie's book, actually. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Debbie Ford was an internationally recognized expert in the field of personal transformation and a pioneering force really in incorporating the study and integration of what she called the human shadow. And she really brought this notion into modern psychological and spiritual practices. And she wrote a book and it was recently discovered. And what's amazing about it is that it has this beautiful motivational prayer uh, woven within it um, and deeply personal stories about her own spiritual journey. And She then translated this experience into a practical plan for transformation. And if you have ever been in the den before, you know I like practical plans for transformation. And if you don't know who Ariel is, uh, besides being Debbie's sister, um, and I don't know if you grew up with that, being Debbie's sister, uh, but uh, Ariel is a leading personality in the personal growth and contemporary spirituality movement. Uh, She has been doing this for 30 years, longer than she's been married. Um, And she's been living, teaching, and promoting consciousness through all forms of media. She really is celebrated as a love and relationship expert, author, speaker. She's a co-creator of, you've probably heard the host of the Evolving Wisdom's Art of Love series. She wrote that book that you all have in your bookshelf called The Soulmate Secret. I know you do. Um, And she also wrote that other book you have on your bookshelf, called um, Turn Your Mate Into Your Soulmate, A Practical Guide to Happily Ever After. And of course, her her other book, Wabi Sabi Love, The Ancient Art of Finding Perfect Love in Imperfect Relationships. So we have um, the spirit of all of the amazing uh, Ford energy here. So let's let's start talking about uh, Debbie's book. And I know that you have the story about how the book came to be published and how it was found. Like what, how did it, how did it evolve? Well, it's a really crazy story. So um, Debbie and I have been friends with James Von Prague forever. And for the couple of people out there who don't know who James Von Prague is, he's uh, the world's most famous medium. He talks to dead people. And the movie The Sixth Sense was about his life. The TV series Ghost Whisperer was about his life. And he is just an amazing channeler who can deliver messages from the other side. And a little more than a year ago, he called to tell me that he had recently moved to San Diego, where we live. And he said, why don't you and your husband and your mom come up for a visit? I'll show you around my new house, and then we'll do a reading with Debbie. Mm, Of course, we said, yeah. 
Well, because you can't actually buy a private reading with him anymore. If you if you want to hope to get a message, you have to see him when he's on stage in front of 3,000 people and hope your dead person is the pushiest one out there. Ah, that's awesome. <laughs> so um, we went up. He lives in Rancho Santa Fe, which is this gorgeous neighborhood with big, beautiful resort-like houses. And when we sat down for the reading with Debbie, she came through instantly. And the first thing she said was, Ariel, you have to write a prayer book with me. And my answer was, no way. Right. <laughs> I don't want to write my own books, let alone write your books. And she's like, no, 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 you have to write a prayer book with me. And I was like, no, Debbie, I just can't do that. And then, and then James said to me, he said, she keeps talking to me about Minnie. Who is Minnie? And I said to him, well, nobody knows this. In fact, you can't even Google this information. But Bo, Debbie's son, has a half-sister in Europe named Minnie. And he goes, oh, okay. He says, it makes sense now. Um, Debbie wants you to tell Bo that when he was with Minnie, she was there too. And what James could not have known was the week before Minnie had come to San Diego to visit Bo and they were together. So now I was like, okay, he's just showing off. Right? right? Wow. Because on top of all of that, Minnie isn't even her real name. That's what we call her. That's her nickname. And she lives in London. She's never here. Wow. So, um, you know, then Brian's parents came through, my mother's uh, husband, my stepfather came through, my dad came through. And then every couple of minutes, Debbie would pop in and she'd say, Ariel, you have to write a prayer book with me. And I was like, no way, that's not going to happen. And finally, 90 minutes into all of this, I realized that she was never going to leave us alone unless I said yes to writing a prayer book with her. And I said to James, I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this. It's not my kind of book. I can't hear her like you hear her. You're, you're possibly going to have to help me. And he said, don't worry, we'll just figure it out. So wow, that's amazing. Right? So yeah. I'm thinking, oh, dear. What, what have I gotten myself into? And as we were driving home, um, Brian says to me, you know, I spent so much time with your sister. I took her to her doctor's appointments and her chemo treatments, and we were so close. And I remember her telling me that she had written some prayers. Why don't you call her office, and maybe somebody has copies of some of them, and that would at least be a start to the book. And I thought, okay, sounds good. So I get home. I send a one-sentence email to her office that says, do you by chance have copies of any prayers that Debbie wrote? And they write me back and they say, oh, we can do better than that. She wrote an entire manuscript. It's attached. What? Yes, that's what I said, because I was her literary agent. So you would think if she'd written a book, I would know about it. But in the last couple of years of her life, she, you know, she had a very long, slow, dreadful death from a rare cancer. We didn't talk about books. We were talking about her pain levels and experimental treatments and what she wanted, what she needed. So anyway, I open up this manuscript and I read it in one sitting and it is beyond beautiful. It's just absolutely breathtakingly, stunningly beautiful. And then I pick up the phone and I call her editor at Harper One, Gideon. And I say, hey, Gideon, it's Ariel. How are you? And the next thing he says is, oh, Ariel, I'm so glad you called. I've been feeling so guilty for the last four years. Your sister always wanted to write a prayer book, and I always talked her out of it. Whoa. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is a crazy story. Okay, what happens next? And then I said to him, well... Gideon, today you have redemption. Open up your inbox. I just sent you the book. And then three days later, he made an offer and he bought it. And last week it was published and it's called Your Holiness, Discover the Light Within. And all I had to write was the five page forward for the book, which tells the story I just shared with you. That's amazing. OK. And so did James say why she didn't say, like, I wrote a book, Ariel, go find it. I mean, is there a reason why, the, like, was there well, a, a I, learning from I, you of, like, going through the process to actually discover well, you know it? What? Um, 
I mean, what what happened is exactly what I just shared. I mean, would it have been easier if she'd said, yes, call Julie. She has the book. <laughs> that easier. But that, you know, as it as it turns out, we found it. And, you know, the reason she never told me about it was because after Gideon said he didn't want it, she just put it away. But because um, Julie runs the whole institute now and always ran her whole life, she knew about it and just, you know, it just never came up prior to when it did. So what's really interesting about the book is that um, years ago, decades ago, Debbie was a drug addict. And she had tried to get sober many times, had gone to rehab centers and always left before the end of the 28 days. But when she was in her fourth treatment center on the 10th day and she was thinking about running and getting ready to leave and go find drugs, she decided instead to go into the bathroom, get on her hands and knees on the dirty floor and pray for the strength to spend one more day in the center because she knew if she didn't give up the drug, she was going to die. And as she was sort of sobbing hysterically and praying as hard as she could, the way she describes it in the book is that this sense of peace and calm came over her and she knew that she had the strength to spend one more day there. And so every day she began this practice of praying to get sober, of praying to find the strength to, you know, recover her life. And really, it was the start of a love affair with God. So this book is more than just a prayer book, because it contains both her personal narrative of overcoming a really hard addiction, along with everything she learned along the way about personal growth and transformation and spirituality and prayer. And it has dozens of her original prayers, as well as prayers by Emmett Fox and Marianne Williamson and others. So it's a very, very prescriptive book that is coded with her love and healing. That is for anybody who's suffering from a heart addiction, a soft addiction, self-doubt, self-loathing, procrastination, wanting to have a better life, but they're stuck and they don't know how to do it. All of that is what she inspires and offers guidance for in her book, Your Holiness. That's amazing. I think that was definitely the the message, the, if the, the, the piece that I really hear that I love is that you're bringing it forward and being able to share this from your, your point of view is just so beautiful. And to be able to have that that ability to go back in time and and be in the journey with someone who's fighting for their life um and the how of it is something that i think all of our listeners would totally be inspired by because um we think that we do things a certain way to get quote unquote what we want what i love about this is that it's about the messiness of it and being in it and using that time as an opportunity to to really get to what it is that you're meant to say. And so I just, I love that. And is there a favorite prayer from the book that you have? And the thing for anybody who might be thinking, well, this is a religious book. This is not a religious book. Okay. It's very much non-denominational and it's about establishing your own relationship with whatever form of divinity speaks to you. So it doesn't matter you know, whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, what Debbie has found is that there is the power of prayer and that you can use it for yourself. Um, and the other thing I want to say about it is um, when you are feeling really bad or you are having a very difficult day, just saying one of these short prayers shifts your focus and attention. Because as Debbie says in the book, when your focus is on your pain and your problems, that's all you can be with. But when you put your attention on asking your highest divine self for help through prayer, when your focus is on prayer, it's not on pain. Mm, I love that. And I always tell clients like, you know, focusing 95% on your of your energy on what's wrong is going to keep you in the what's wrong. And so having that wedge and a resource to just say, you know what, I'm just going to read this one page, right? I'm just going to take 
I'm going to take a, a, a chance to focus on the solution, to be in connection with something bigger than myself, to be in taking responsibility for what I want to create just by reading something like that um, yeah. or a practice is really a, a daily game changer. And one change every day, right? Moment to moment. Obviously, anyone who's been through addiction knows it's moment by moment, right? That's how you wake up. And then all those decisions added up to a different life. Right. Well, here's one of my favorite prayers. It says, let me surrender my will and give up my agendas so that I may go where you want to take me. Let me be humble enough to know that you know what is best for me. Let me be trusting enough to believe that you want the best for me. Let me follow your lead, listening for the exact steps that will direct me to, to a complete experience of you. Let me glide across the floor of this day with grace ease and joy oh my gosh that's beautiful what why do you why does that one stand out to you like what what's the meaning in that for you well you know i think it's really about trust and faith and surrender you know i don't believe that we're meant to do everything alone and that you know there is this unseen um divine higher self that we can call upon to, to hold our hand through life because life isn't easy, you know, and, and none of us are meant to do it alone. So regardless, if you want to call it God, God is the universe, all that is, we all have access to this power if we're willing to be a little bit humble and ask for help. Mm, and I love that, the visual of um, gliding. Yes. You know, yeah. gliding through the day with, what did she say, with grace? Grace, ease, and joy. Yeah, and and put it in context, right? There she is. She's in this rehab place, probably not feeling one damn ounce of of joy or ease or grace, and asking for it and setting that intention of gliding through the day. And that, to me, is that's so powerful and inspirational. And that's that's how you change your life. That's how she changed her life. That's how you get to hear the message to share this. And now now is divine timing. There must be a reason why it happened now, Ariel. Well, I think, you know, I don't, I believe that it's happening now because people need it more than ever, because mm. I'm sure most of the, your, your people, and I know mine are tend to be highly sensitive people. They're em, em, empaths, you know, they yep. feel other people. And so right now we're not only struggling with the day-to-day -day stress of our own individual lives, but there's so much stress and turmoil in the world that many of us are reacting negatively to the stress of other people. So it's, it's compounded. So I believe the book came out now to remind us and to inspire us that, that love is possible, all kinds of love, and that we need to have faith and trust and we need to be able to surrender all the pain that we're picking up on that we're feeling. Mm. That's my thought about it. That's so beautiful. So, so let's talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> Enough about this. Enough um, about Debbie. So oh, when I, now when I, you, <laughs> Marnie, I do want to say one more thing. If yeah. anybody's interested in getting the book, if they go to debbieford.com, there's lots of ways to buy the book off of there. But what's great about going to debbieford.com is that there's bonuses. And one of the bonuses is, um, I did an interview with Debbie about the book through James that we oh, videotaped. So there's so a cool. half hour video. Yeah. It's, and it goes really deep dish. There's a bunch of her meditations that you can download as audios. And here's the really fun part. Uh, one person who registers on that site for buying the book, will win a private reading with James Von Prague. Dang, girls, ladies, go. So we'll put the link in the show notes for those of you who are driving at the gym, in the airport, whatever, for sure. Um, it's debbieford.com, though, if you're like, you know, you want to just hop on over there right now with the tap of the keyboard, your iPad, whatever device you're on. Um, that's amazing. Wow. Well, I want to hear what happens in that, too. This is like a to-be-continued. <laughs> That's so cool. I mean, I feel like there's talk about divine. There's like some, like whoever gets that, there's just, it's going to all tie together. I believe that. Um, so let's talk about um, the quantum science of love and, and manifesting. So you, you decide I'm going to pick myself up the floor. I'm going to be inspired by Debbie Ford. I'm going to, I'm going to pray whatever that means to me. I'm going to be an intention. What, 
what what's the next part? What what do you what do you want to? Well, yeah. for those, those who are seeking to manifest a soulmate, you know, basic law of attraction states we draw to us the people, places, and things that match our state of being. You know, so when you're in the state of being, I'm loved, I'm lovable, I'm deserving of love, of course you're going to attract love. And if you're in the state of uh, I'm unlucky in love, I'm a loser in love, love's for other people, not for me, it's too late for me, you will be repelling love. And the thing that I want to remind people about, or maybe even teach them for the first time, is that according to quantum science, there are certain things that are true about the universe. One is that there is no time. There is just this now moment. There's no past. There's no future. There's just the now moment. The second thing is, is that we all live in what is called the field or the divine matrix. And in the field, we are already connected to everything and everybody. So once you accept that and know that, The truth is your soulmate is not missing because on the unseen plane, you are already connected to them. Okay. They're not missing. They're just on the unseen plane and you already have that connection. It's what I like to call love before first sight. So what you can do today in this now moment is drop into your heart and start the relationship with them. You don't know their name. You don't know where they live. You don't know what day you're going to meet them on in the 3D world. But that's no reason not to begin your connection today. And one of the reasons I believe Brian and I recognized each other instantly on the day that we met in the physical world is because for the six months prior to meeting, I had been talking to him every single day. We already had a strong heart connection. So I believe in doing absolutely every little thing that Marnie tells you to do (laughs) and add in the quantum science piece to it, knowing and trusting that the one you've asked for is already yours. I love that. So in uh, my world, uh, we have a hashtag for that. You want to hear what it is? Yes. It's hashtag certainty, bitches. (laughs) (laughs) right it's certainty like that's it right there's the guy he's out there i can't see him he's there if i am certain then what is it that i need to do to then create the mirror to draw towards me right like i am love now is the time you know that my man is looking for me right like to have that in your core paradigm and then to actually have that certainty and trust like debbie's talking about that yes. the divine is taking care of you and then be in action of it. I totally had this moment with what I call God, like in February of 2009, right before I met my husband in April and I had been doing all this work and I realized that I had this barrier and I, I made this huge breakthrough and I said, you know, God, you totally uh, hooked up dad, right? Like my mom passed away and my dad went on one date online and he met the woman who's now my stepmom. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm totally ready. Why Why hasn't this happened before? And I got this clear message. You didn't ask. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm asking. And then I was like, going to be in action of it. Like I was in action. I knew it was going to happen. I decided I was totally ready. I created that. Like you were talking about that, talking to that person. And then I had that same moment when I met Jeremy. Like we, our eyes met sort of in a weird, weird and unplanned way. And I was like, hmm. There's something going on here. Um, and let me ask you this. So if someone doesn't have that moment, like it sounds like you and Brian had, and maybe Jeremy and I had, where maybe there's not that instant knowing. Well, most of the time there isn't. What we had is extremely rare. Like maybe 1% of the people know instantly, which is why I always encourage people to, you know, give guys as many chances as possible so they can really start to show up because women have this false belief that they're going to know instantly, oh, he's it, he's not it. They're going to know in 20 seconds, yes, no. And the truth is, it's, that's not how it works most of the time. In fact, there was one study I saw that showed that most women who ended up marrying somebody didn't really feel attraction until the fifth date. I love that because that 
if you're in the like waiting for that one moment, then it, you get so into the habit of ruling out and then you're repelling instead of drawing and in, right? That because you could have that moment and it could be lust. It isn't necessarily real. So in my case, even though Brian and I met and we both knew, we didn't get married until 13 months after we met because I was smart enough to know that even I had all these feelings, oh, he's my soulmate. I needed to know. I needed to get to know him. So regardless of whatever feelings you're having, it's really important that you factor in at least 12 months of dating before you commit the rest of your life to somebody. I love that. That's what I love about Arielle Ford. She's all in the like woo woo, but also in the real because there's it's the it's the synthesis of both. Right. That yes. creates yes. a reality because we all live in this plane. Yeah. And I've seen so many people mistake lust for, you know, love, and we know how different they can be. And, and the other thing is the thing I've been noticing more and more lately with women is that they're so judgmental. They're so hard on men. And I, I think part of it stems because they're hard on themselves, but really you got to give guys a break and give them a chance to shine and show up and be the heroes that they can be. And it's not going to happen on the first coffee date most of the time. It just isn't. So I always tell people, if you're going out on a date, instead of looking for what's wrong or what isn't working for you, imagine you had to call me after the date and tell me three things you really liked about the guy. If you could have your attention on looking for what's right, you're going to find the one so much faster. I love that. Okay, I have one more bonus question while I've got Ariel Ford in the den. <laughs> I've got to take advantage of my time with you. Um, you know, our clients, like, you know, they go through the process, they're dating, maybe they're dating for, you know, two months, maybe it's just a brand new thing. And it kind of circles back to that, like, that knowing um, to the idea or the story or the fantasy of what it's supposed to be like versus what it really is like over that 13 months or that 12 months. One of our clients said something like, you know, it's really frustrating because I, I know who I want and I know the qualities and characteristics. And, you know, what I'm noticing is this person isn't on point every time. Can you speak to this whole idea about like, you know, your soul mate, and maybe that's the point that they're not on point all the time. Or, you know, what, what, what do you kind well, of believe not, around that? You're not ordering a cashmere sweater from Neiman Marcus here. You know, uh, let's, let's get real about what love is. Okay. So, so most people have a really immature view of love. They think love is a feeling. Okay. Oh, Marnie, I know I love you because I feel it. You know, it's like champagne bubbles going through my bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is some of that to love, but the truth is real adult, mature soulmate love has very little to do with feelings. Love is a behavior. It's a practice. It's a choice. It's a decision. And as all of us who are married to our soulmates know, there will be days when you hate your soulmate. And it doesn't mean that you don't love them. So they're not going to show up perfect. They're going to show up perfect for you. And you have to know ahead of time just six things. Okay? The only six things you need to know is what are your three must-haves and what are your three deal-breakers? Because you can make a list of 50 or 100 items, which I did, and I did get most of them, but they weren't about height, weight, exact income level, you know, eye color, waist size. You know, they were about traits and qualities, you know, heart traits and qualities, because real soulmate love is about healing. That's the purpose of real soulmate love, that you're going to end up falling in love with somebody and you're going to have the big chemical high, the dopamine, the adrenaline, the oxytocin, and it's going to feel really good for like six to 18 months. <laughs> and then it's going to go away mostly. And you're going to end up with this real human being. And there are going to be days where they trigger your deepest, worst pain points. And that's what taking sacred vows is all about. It's about bringing all the stuff up for healing. So you're there to be best friends and partners, to love each other, to support each other, to be each other's best friends, and to heal each other. And it's not always going to be pretty. Um, so 
to start judging somebody on the second or third date, well, they just don't have it. You may know that for sure, but chances are you haven't really given them a chance to show up, to show who they are. And if we have two minutes, I'll just share one yeah, story. Yeah, I love it. So I had this woman who, you know, she really heard me about like giving extra dates, you know, like as our friend Carol Allen says, if they don't completely gross you out, give them a second chance. Exactly. So good. And so she was out on the fifth date with this guy and everything about him was nice enough. She just wasn't feeling it. You know, (laughs) she didn't have any major complaints. There just, just wasn't it for her. And so they were driving home at the end of the fifth date, and she was thinking about how she was going to let him know, hey, you're a great guy, but I'm just not feeling it. When suddenly he hit the brakes, stopped short, because the car in front of him had hit a dog and then drove off. Mm. Her date jumped out of the car, scooped up the dog, put the dog in the back seat, told her to get on her smartphone and find the nearest emergency vet. He drove the dog to the vet, carried the dog in, uh, you know, explained what happened. He said, is the dog chipped? If the dog's chipped, let me call the owner. They took, the dog had a broken leg. He called the owner and said, hey, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but, you know, Snoopy got hit by a car. I'm here at the XYZ emergency vet. I'm getting him fixed up. Give me your address. I'm going to bring him home to you in an hour. And this girl fell in love with him at that moment, and they're now married and have a baby. I love that. And I hear stories like that freaking all the time when people have the the openness, the patience, and the certainty (laughs) that the process is unfolding. And... I freaking love that. And I just want you all to remember the woman who's giving you this advice has been married 20 damn years. Okay. So she's not making it up. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's, here's the other thing to remember there, there is a lid for every pot. That's what grandmother used to say. And there's multiple lids. So there's not just one potential soulmate out there for you. There's dozens. John Gray believes there's 200,000 for each of us, whatever the number is, there's no shortage of really good, conscious men who want to be devoted husbands, okay? They're out there, and they're everywhere. They're online. I have so many friends that met the perfect guys on Match.com. JJ Virgin met her husband on Match.com. My friend Liz Dawn at age 50 met the perfect guy on Match.com. I mean, they're out there. You just have to be willing to not give in to the negative thinking in your head. Oh, it's too late. I'm too fat. The good ones are taken. That's all bullshit. It's not true. You know, the only, the only time it's going to be true is if you insist on it, in which case what I can promise you is that you're going to die alone. Amen. Yeah. You know, you keep listening to your thoughts, your negative thoughts, and you're going to make them all come true. Yeah. Ariel's right. Ladies. So listen to her. (laughs) Do what Ariel says. It's true. I, you know what I was doing? So uh, a couple days ago, Brian and I officiated a wedding at um, Balboa Park in the Japanese Friendship Garden for a woman in her mid-60s who'd been divorced for 25 years. But she came uh, to one of my workshops and she decided to go for it. And two years after the workshop, we performed her wedding to the most perfect man for her. And, you know, one of the things on her must-have list was blue eyes. He's got the most beautiful blue eyes. And she wanted somebody she could who would be her warrior and she would feel safe with. And they are so completely blissed out, you know, and it was just so much fun to be with somebody who, you know, when we first met her was like, you know, Oh, I'm 35 pounds overweight and, you know, I'm retired on social security and blah, blah, blah. And now she's a blissful bride. I love that. So let's wrap this episode up with, um, cause it's the theme It's Debbie saying, hashtag certainty, bitches. Like, Ariel, go get the damn book done. (laughs) It's the 60-year-old woman in Balboa Park. It doesn't matter what my conditions are. Certainty, bitches, it's happening. 
So don't let your limitation become your limits. You know, don't let the story and the fear and the negativity be in your way. Get down to work. I love this book. I love Debbie's gift. Check it out in the show notes. And just give pe- give love a chance. Is that a song? I can't sing. I, I give can't. peace a chance. Give, give peace, peace a chance. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if he's a chance. All right, Ariel, I love you. Let's come back. Okay. I want to have you back after your trip, and I'm going to, okay. like, make you come up with these brilliant metaphors about what you learned in Greece about love. Okay. How's that? I can't wait. Thanks for having me on. All right. And ladies, don't forget, date with some dignity. Love you all. Bye-bye.